Good evening to all the limitless people who are watching us live right now from YouTube on this Limitless show. I am a coach and I totally, totally believe with all my heart that coaching is truly a noble profession. Today, there is no dearth of coaches. The market is flooded with loads of coaches in India and abroad. But what I want to today share with you is coaching is not just about finishing our certifications and then, you know, just using those tools and strategies on the clients. It's a more holistic process than we would like to believe. It's about learning and growing ourselves, first transforming our own selves and then bringing those applied information, those things to our clients to transform their lives. Today, I have a very, very special guest with me on the show who is special because she has done a lot of deep work, not only on herself, but has also brought it to her clients through her work. And she would be throwing a lot of in-depth light on the noble profession of coaching. So let me tell you a little brief about Amrita A. Singh, who's our guest. She's a master certified leadership coach and a professionally certified leadership and life coach with over 27 years of business experience and she runs her independent practice back to source coaching. She created her own unique model of coaching that integrates her understanding of the Bhagavad Gita to the coaching profession. She grounded her study further as a certified deep transformational coach. She is also a mentor coach and an empaneled coach with leading MNCs. She is also described by those who know her and have worked with her as a leader with strong people development skills, disciplined coaching practices, and the ability to not only motivate her teams, but also empower them to succeed in whatever they set out to do. Amrita's mission is to help individuals find what they were born to do. She loves helping others see their true potential, find their purpose and navigate a path that's aligned with who they are. She has worked in the corporate sector for 10 years and she's also a certified Enneagram practitioner and a neuro-linguistic program uh, practitioner. Also, she has done non-violent communication as a part of a continuous education in the field of human potential. She has also been profiled by BBC, CNBC, NDTV, and TOI as an entrepreneur and change catalyst. She also has recently been written about in a book called Leading Ladies, which is an international publication. So without further ado, let us bring on Amrita Singh with us with a warm round of applause. Thank, Thank you, you Anshu. Amrita. Thank you Namaste. for joining me here. Namaste. Namaste. So glad and honored to have you here, Amrita, because I know you are a very, very deep and a spiritual human being. And uh, the first time I ever spoke to you, I, I was totally, I mean, um, uh, I don't have word. So I was really fixated on the conversation that we had and I loved every moment of it. And I see you bringing all of that here today on this show. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me here. Um, it's a joy uh, uh, to be here and share a conversation. Uh, there are limitless possibilities of where you'd like yes. to begin, where you'd like to take this. So um, wherever you wish to start and wherever you Absolutely. wish to take it, it's your sure. show. <laughs> all right. What have your be? I mean, your learnings been from Bhagavad Gita, and how have you managed to align them with coaching? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Not one that I've been asked before. Um, and I think um, my biggest learning um, from the Bhagavad Gita, many learnings, but as they flow through me, as I share now, 
um, is that um, human life uh, that we have been given is a gift uh, and cherishing that gift and making the most of that gift uh, is completely and totally our responsibility. Um, and to me, um, what that gift was has shifted over the years. Um, so let's say before I was exposed to any kind of uh, um, understanding of um, this gift of uh, human life, uh, I was like, you know, like, like I hear my children saying, you only live once, YOLO, FOMO, and all of these things. And so live it up, enjoy life. Um, and that's all that there is to life. Um, and then I've seen myself as I look back now, um, and uh, the gray hair tells that I'm 50 years. So when I look back now uh, to maybe 25 years ago, I think um, somewhere I began the quest of questioning that. And um, through that, it took me um, to uh, spiritual shopping, as I like to call it. Uh, and then led me um, to the feet of my spiritual master, uh, whose uh, name is Ma Samdhidana and Saraswati. And everything mm -hmm. that I share, uh, uh, you know, comes through her, through her grace. And uh, like I say, like I shared with you, it's just this, this show itself is an offering to her and the immense, um, immense love, gratitude. I mean, she is um, my anchor. Uh, she's, she's, I mean, a, I get goosebumps even thinking about, I can't even describe the presence, her presence in my life. But she's uh, the one who taught me the Bhagavad Gita, I continue to learn with her now for now 17 years. And um, if there were three things that I've learned, um, if, if I was to sum it up in three things, I would say uh, one is the sense of acceptance and acceptance uh, of everything and anything that's happening, good, bad, uh, with uh, with a sense of knowing that it's there in this moment and it will pass, the good as well as the bad. So the sense yes. of what she calls glad acceptance. Yes. The second um, biggest uh, learning is the sense of um, doing my best and giving my 100% to whatever it is that I'm doing. Uh, if it's the show, then the show, if it was taking care of my mother just a few minutes before I got onto the show, then that, uh, and being able to be in that present moment and give it your 100%. And the third is uh, the sense of masti and fun and uh, just um, enjoying life and celebrating life uh, for the gift it is and um, holding life lightly. Uh, and I think that's really all the three things that I've learned from her. Uh, from the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita, and I try to bring that to my life every day. So beautiful and so beautifully shared, because uh, yes, we have we have constantly heard stories of this too shall pass, and uh, nothing is. I mean, change is the only constant, so nothing remains. Everything has to finally pass. So so beautiful, and of course, what is there in front of us is the present never the past, never the future. What we can experience is only this present moment. So it's better to live life from the present moment and yeah, never take life to life, seriously. <laughs> no one has passed out of this life alive. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and have so the sense of having fun for everything that you do uh, and who, who you are, who I am, who you are uh, is such a gift. It is. It is. When we realize this, we start enjoying life actually to the head. Yeah. Otherwise, we keep worrying too much. <laughs> yes. So in Mumbai, you had started actually, uh, you began with, uh, I think, some daycare center that you had opened and which later was acquired by an investment fund. 
could you tell us more about how you got started first of all with that and then why did you sell it out and then move to coaching what has your journey been like uh so um 30 uh, 30 years i'll try and recap in in maybe 3 minutes um and um, share that i when i connect the dots backward in my life uh then i think that everything in my life has been an extension of my own personal journey if i go back to when i finished my mba in 1996 uh, i'm a you know very 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 happy and proud and uh, indian to be born here in india so i was certain that i wanted to do something to make india a beautiful space so i joined really uh, the government of india and started work in a bank Uh, mm-hmm. thinking that i'm going to make this huge difference and contribution uh, in right. in a bank right uh, and uh, from there um, i moved um because I, i felt that i was not being able to engage with that sense of fullness that i wanted to bring to it um and i was also extremely immature at that time uh, to think that you know if this doesn't work shift if this doesn't work shift but that's what i did then and i moved uh, to work then with an export house where it was traveling all across india and showcasing india in a global market and i loved that work loved that work it was in the work of home furnishing exports uh, taking indian product and find giving them a space overseas uh and uh, it it gave me a great sense of pride to do that and i thought i will do that for the rest of my life um as life had it uh, of course i i met uh, met my husband we got married we married now for 25 years i love to say i love him more today than i did 25 years ago uh and um we had our first child and when we had our first child the uh, the uh, the thing is that you know i thought somebody will come to take care of him in india i married to a north indian so i thought i've given birth to a son good looking son uh gora chitta like that how my mother in law used to say and i thought she'll come to take care of him or at least my mom was says in pune 100% she'll be here to support me and they said no this is your responsibility that was my first uh, first taste of uh, taking responsibility and uh, we're here to enjoy our grandchildren but you have the one who has to be the primary caregiver and as i looked around in my batchmate i found batchmates i found that a lot of them were either choosing not to have children or giving up their career um to raise children and uh, i thought it would i would like to make a difference um uh, in that space again that sense of making a contribution theme played on and um i must say it wasn't my idea it was the idea of my best friend uh, who still is my best friend uh her name is bindu and she said okay let's start a daycare center and i said wow it'll be perfect we'll start a center and um my children will be taken care of, both of our children will be taken care of and we'll take care of many other children and so for a lark we started a, a daycare business but being a thorough professional i said i don't want to do it from home uh, we'll do it professionally and so we rented a space put in all our savings that we had from that 7 years of working till then and we started a daycare business and we uh, grew it as our own 100% as our own gave a 100% lived each day present moment had lots of fun uh, as we did it um and uh, we went and slowly by slowly it just grew organically from one center to two centers then we started running it in organizations uh, and it reached a space after 14 years we used to run it in bombay as well as in in gurgaon multiple organizations multiple community centers we had 16 at that time over a 14 year period that it reached a zero sum game it reached a space where what we could provide to the business uh was zilch and what we could get from the business was also zero and what i mean by that is this the center was running completely on autopilot uh we had zero attrition all the people who worked with us were from the first day we started we just added numbers and we had 180 women who worked with us at that time and everyone ran it with that sense of ownership and accountability 
Um, so we could sit at home. It became the first ISO certified daycare in India and it was running. So we had really nothing to do. And uh, uh, a lot of our own uh, investment banker friends and people in the corporate world said, this is a time for you to cash in, relax, enjoy, it's running and keep it going. But there was nothing more that we could give that space. And if we held on to it, uh, then uh, it would be a disservice to, I think, to the business as well as to us, because we were zero attrition, zero, zero uh, financial debt, absolutely cash flow positive, um, and uh, having great fun doing it. And our children had outgrown the space. They had both become older, both our children, Bindu's as well as mine. And so when uh, our biggest competitor said, would you like to sell it? We didn't even know that there's something called you could sell a business. You thought you could just buy and sell product. We had no idea that a business could be sold. We lived in our little cocoon. And uh, so I said, sure. How much would you like to buy it for? Was my response to her. She said, well, if you're interested, then we can start having that conversation. And that conversation led to an investment fund that was investing in daycare business in India. Uh, we found that there was a fit and uh, and we decided to let go of it. And I must share with you uh, that um, they, it was pretty tempting to like, okay, there's suddenly this inflow of money. Because I remember when Bindu and I started the business, we would sit like little munshis on our table and count, oh, we've earned so much money from fees. Now we've paid this fees. We've paid this much fees. Now we have so much money left so we can go out and have a good dinner. Uh, that's how we, you know, we used to, run just like you'd run your house when you're just starting yes. off yes. and suddenly there's this huge inflow of capital so uh, the greedy mind said wow this seems like a good proposition suddenly you see you know money and uh, I said oh no but to be fair to it that there's nothing more that I can give this there's no contribution so this too shall pass the money will pass but uh, what will remain is um, who I am, what I want to do, and how I want to make my life meaningful. And this is not it. And I remember having a conversation with my Guruji, and I said, they're making me a really tempting offer to stay. Um, and I know I don't want to stay because it's a zero-sum game. But I, do, I know I want to do something in life. I don't know what it is. I want to work. I want to continue contributing. I don't know what it is. And I remember her sharing with me that you have to let it go. And only when you let it go, will you make space for whatever there is to come into your life. I have no idea what it is. You have no idea what it is. But I can only tell you that make space for whatever it is and be open to receiving. And uh, that's really how um, I opened myself uh, first to let it go and then to make space for allowance of whatever was destined in my space that's really how I how I came to coaching I got coached myself so they hired a coach to coach me and I said how, how did coaching happen actually so they hired a coach uh, there was a, a coach that was hired uh, and uh, I, I went it first was a in, in a group coaching format and then in a one-on-one -on -one format I didn't know it was group coaching then I thought I was going for a training program mm -hmm. um, and um, his his name is uh, Thomas Goldthrop uh, and uh, goes by an Indian name, Braj Mohan Das. So that's really, I think, that divine way. And when he was talking to me, I said, there is something more to you than just this engagement. You know, you see, I know that we're all spiritual beings and I sense that energy. And then he sh shared that, you know, well, actually, my I've taken on the name of uh, Braj Mohan Das and he's an ISKCON follower, uh, still, still very much in touch with him. He's based in Delhi. Uh, and um, I said, I want to, I'm sure I don't want to do this work as CEO or a head of HR or just business development. I'm good at it, but I don't want to do it. But I definitely want to do the work that you're doing. So tell me more about it. Uh, and so he told me, he introduced me to the world of coaching. And then I started researching it. I had made some amount of money through the sale of this business. So I invested in a, in a coach training program. And I thought, hey, I'm this amazing entrepreneur. And I had, uh, at that time, when your businesses were being bought and sold, I had lots of my friends saying, 
what's the next business? You know, we'll put money in it. We'll do this. We'll do that. So I said, okay, cool. I'm going to start this new business uh, in the space of coaching. And when I was doing my coach training program, my best friend Bindu, she also did a program to work with children. And uh, she was doing a mindfulness program. And my, when I finished the course, which was a nine month course, she asked, my teacher asked me that, um, so what's the designation you'd like to give yourself? So I said, I'd like to like, you know, support people in the space of meaning and fulfillment. So fulfillment coach. So she said, well, you know, a lot of people have taken fulfillment uh, as a designation. So it'll be really crowded, you know, just like you were saying in your opening space, it's a crowded space. And that time fulfillment was really crowded. She said, well, have you thought of, can you think of another designation you'd like to give yourself? So I googled other words that meant fulfillment and somehow I came to mindfulness. It resonated with me because Bindu was doing something in mindfulness. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, let me be a mindfulness coach. So I received my first certificate as a certified mindfulness coach. Designation right. I gave myself, having right. no clue really about it. Uh, and I started off a business and fell flat on my face. Uh, nobody was willing to hold space to trust me to hold space for them so I said okay let me go back um, and uh, learn some more so I went back to the corporate sector I started working with a leadership development firm where I had complete clarity that there's only one thing that I want to do and that's coaching I didn't want to do don't didn't want to do anything else and um the gentleman I worked for, he said, well, if you want to work for me, you have to reinvest and do this course, uh, which is the course that we run and represent here in India. And so, of course, uh, by one of my first teachers and mentors, Peter Redding. Okay. Um, right. And I'm so happy I did that course. I'm so happy I, I reinvested and did that course. Mm -hmm. Because for me, that was, uh, that I think was that homecoming Right. My spiritual practice right. and my uh, material pursuits, because I still have material pursuits uh, and that are fulfilled uh, through the modality of coaching. But it allowed for both of them to come together. And I like to say that uh, my Guruji uh, showed me, taught me, reminds me every day that I'm divine. And coaching uh, gives an expression to that divinity. Uh, and that's really how I came to coaching. How beautiful, how beautiful. And thank you for actually sharing, uh, you know, all these nitty gritties, because I think uh, it was pretty helpful for anyone who, who's looking at more depth of, you know, behind the scenes. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. And I hope, you, I hope whoever's listening in knows that uh, it's a path that goes up and down. It, it appears from the outside that, wow, these people have, you know, engaged, reached there, done that. But, uh, and that path even keeps, continues going up and down. It's, uh, that's just the nature of life itself. That's the nature of life. Yes, I, I totally believe that. So, uh, Amrita, what, what's the difference between a professionally certified coach, a master certified coach and a deep transformational coach? I think they're all just labels. They're, they're all just labels. Uh, uh, and I acknowledge uh, the need to have labels to be able to put myself out there. Um, and so they're all just different labels that I have received through my process of continuous learning. So um, as I worked, um, as I got introduced to coaching first with Peter, and I um, completed my master certified leadership coach training with Peter and his organization, and I used to, for the longest time, train alongside with him and co-facilitate programs to support other people to be coaches, mm -hmm. which required me to be this master certified leadership coach. That's where uh, it gave me this opportunity because it was part of the requirement of the master's program to create my own model of coaching. Uh, and that's the integration piece. Um, of, of, the, of the Bhagavad Gita, and I like I shared with you, uh, is that it's not that um, I cannot um, as ever claim uh, to, I'm still a student of Bhagavad Gita, uh, but the wisdom that I have received of the Bhagavad Gita and the parallels that I have found uh, in terms of being able to bring that to a coaching context is what I have done um, 
through my coaching model, which I call back to source coaching. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, it's, it's a journey back home. It's a journey back to source. And it starts from accessing your source and staying anchored in your source. And all the other roles that we play and all the other goals that we have are just a manifestation of that. Uh, and that's, that's the process that I um, support uh, my clients to navigate through. And it's a limitless. It's like we are limited beings, but we have access to limitless energy uh, present um, within us and all around us. And so connecting with that highest energy to support us through whether it's executive presence or strategic mindset or team effectiveness or career transition, which are typically the kinds of clients that come to me. Um, It's possible by accessing that best resource, which is your own source. Uh, So that's that's the master certified leadership coach uh, process. Um, And um, through my journey as a coach and through my continuous learning, I met in the corridors of a conference room, uh, Leon Vanderpool, and uh, there was just this deep resonance. uh, And it seemed to me that I needed to make space for his work in my life. And so I offered myself empty uh, to his work and the beauty of his work uh, really is of letting go of any frameworks, all tools, all techniques, uh, and just bringing my presence to any situation uh, and learning to be an embodiment um, of that is uh, what I have learned and continue to learn through Leon's work. Uh, So that's the deep transformational space where I hold space for conversations but get myself out of the way and allow source to do the work. Uh, So that's, that's the, that's the deep transformation piece. Amazing. This is, it sounds, the sound itself of whatever you have just shared is so sacred, actually. So sacred. And if we can just understand, uh, this is what I meant when in the beginning I was sharing about coaching because as coaches I think we hold the space for the other person they come to us looking for someone who can hold their hands and help them with that much needed transformation they are looking at and we become the medium we are only a medium of course but then I think uh, if we can anchor ourselves in that source uh, it, it comes very easy to be able to facilitate that rather than just using the plain tools and techniques and strategies and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's, uh, to me, coaching uh, is, uh, is a spiritual process. It's, yes. It is nothing other than a spiritual process. And I also say that coaching uh, to me is just an excuse for personal mastery. Uh, I have to continue to be grounded in being that instrument and be keeping myself clean to be able to hold that space yes. uh, for another, for which I have to be committed to my own journey back to source yes. uh, and trust that the other person will find their own way. I can just be that light. Yes, I totally, totally agree. And uh, in fact, uh, this was the year for me as well when I started understanding this uh, nitty gritty of coaching as well. Till last year, I was uh, looking at more uh, about all those tools and everything. And by my own self, I started understanding that, no, I am just actually holding space for the other person and helping them find their own light. Yeah. Yes, that is so true. And what's wonderful is that the light that they discover is no different from the light that I'm shining. Yes, uh, it's just uh, it's it's almost light meeting light. That's yes. it. And then there's no coach, there's no client. There's just that space of pos- limitless limitless possibility. possibility. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so true. Uh, so uh, Amrita, also 
do you think every human being who was born on this planet was born to discover their true potential because there are people in all facets and all kinds of places from a person who's working very hard as a mean you know you know menial labor to people working in mines and you know what not i mean people going through so much hardships in life do you really i mean we sitting we are sitting comfortable in our homes mm. and we can talk all this gyan and you know so much intellectual stuff because we are in comforts of our own home we are really you know having everything to talk but people who are just working so hard to earn their bread can they think about true potential and purpose and they were they meant were they born to discover that so um i can't say well let me let, let me share that the way that i see the world i think that um, each and every individual has that opportunity irrespective of their situation their circumstances um to discover their true potential each and every single individual has whether they make use of that opportunity or not is completely up to them and it's not for a space for me to judge whether they do or they don't but i definitely think that it is my responsibility to be able to see that potential in every human being that i engage with whether it is the um, you that i'm interacting with on the show whether it's the watchman who opens the door uh whether it's the ceo that i meet and um, in india especially we have <clears throat> that most beautiful greeting of namaste and uh, just my role is just to say namaste to the other person and i trust that that ignites that spark in them uh and whether they um, engage with it or not i can't stop saying namaste so i'm more focused on what is it that i'm here to offer and trust that uh, in doing that they will receive it when they are open to receive it i play no role uh in them exercising the opportunity that they have been gifted with uh but i definitely take the responsibility in every waking moment to remind them of their true potential thank you so then my next question is amrita why are only 5% of the people i mean why is it is that also a hard reality that out of the 7 plus billion population there are hardly 5% who are supposed to be leading a life of their purpose or their true potential 95% are still sleeping on their potential so i don't uh, i'm i'm not a uh, uh, either numbers driven or um, uh, numbers focused person but i'm uh, definitely focused on the heart center heart. and human 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 connection piece of it and i think that um, if we put ourselves in that 5% that you call then it becomes that much more imperative for the 5% to support the 95% um and um, we can do it in our own way a and I'll, i'll share with you an example um is that in my home where i stay in bombay uh, it's my husband me and my two children and i have to uh, domestic help uh, who are part of our family and they've been one has been with me for 16 years and one has uh, been with me for now 7 years and um 
we're we are a family and uh, they i know that they feel it for sure and yes they have left their homes and they're coming here to work and they probably have no idea about their potential but then it's it's incumbent on me to remind them of that potential so when a meal is cooked really well it's imperative on me to go and say thank you express my gratitude and shine the light on how brilliantly they did it whatever my daughter does in school it's imperative on me to focus on what she's done brilliantly so that she is motivated to shine in her brilliance uh, as against what she didn't do well mm-hmm. that's my role mm-hmm. uh, the choices that my son makes in his life to bring the sense of acceptance to it is my responsibility so that he can discover his truth and shine in that uh, my husband has been a rock solid support as i have navigated and come to this space where i feel this great inner and outer fulfillment both mm-hmm. uh, but reminding him about the significant piece that he plays in my life is my responsibility uh, and there and and living my truth is my responsibility no matter what it what the situation is uh, and i think we cannot influence the 95 if 95 is the right number but uh, we can at least through our own presence inspire uh, by walking the talk ourselves totally agree totally agree at least whatever in whatever i think in moment to moment whoever we come across if we are able to shine a light on each and every person at least that much is our moral responsibility as well and uh, yeah and i just want to you know especially for the people who are listening in and you know the shining the light may seem like really esoteric piece of it and oh i don't even know what my light is but i think that um, and uh, uh, just i mean just being a good human being and treating another as a human being as a human being um uh, irrespective of their background irrespective of choices irrespective of preferences i think is the most basic piece yes once you are grounded in being a good human being you have the opportunity limitless opportunity to expand that capacity to see each other as spiritual beings and i um, the thought that's flowing through me now is that 100% all of us are spiritual beings there may be through your statistics 5% who are aware of it that doesn't make the 95 not being spiritual beings it's just that they're not aware of it they're just not aware of it that's all and therefore when uh, when you become aware of it and that's that's the reason why i feel so committed uh to this path of uh, supporting people navigate through an inward journey which i see is my purpose in life is primarily because having received that sense of awareness yes experienced it myself and continuing to bask in the magnificence of it the brilliance of it um, i cannot help it's like a cup that overflows from the space yes. of abundance you can't i can't help but want to bring that want to the to lives bring. of others yes. it's it's just so beautiful yes totally and that's agree. that's really what drives me uh uh irrespective of situation circumstances uh to keep having these conversations whether it's through a podcast or through my writing or through coaching or through workshops but just supporting people to return back to their source right so uh amrita what according to you are the key areas for personal mastery um i would say um commitment to your personal mastery uh second is the sense of um making it a priority and actually i would say 
I'm, I'm just saying the same thing in different ways. I would say just one thing then, being 100% committed to your own journey, uh, your own journey of personal mastery is, I think, just the key. If I would say commitment, discipline, priority, um, being on that path, uh, all of that is important. And if I was to say uh, another thing is, is finding, searching and finding somebody uh, to shine the light for you. I, and even as I, you know, um, I, I, like I share, I have my, my own Guruji who's uh, points the direction, walks the path herself, makes it very easy just to follow her footsteps. Um, and that keeps me grounded in my inward journey. I continue to uh, coach people, yes, but I continue to work with a coach myself. I've never stopped working with a coach myself. Um, if, that is, if that is what I believe has so much potential in, in being on the path, then I might as well bring that same input back to my life. Because um, every single day I slip, but every single day I come back to the path. How beautiful. So, uh, I mean, uh, just for the uh, people who are listening to us, what really is personal mastery? Actually, what is personal mastery? I would say personal mastery is uh, understanding who you truly are and allowing yourself to blossom where you are planted. Beautifully put together. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, so then what are the uh, ingredients in exploring the dish of true potential in anyone's life? And is it the same as our higher purpose? We keep saying our higher purpose as well. We keep saying true potential. Is our true potential aligned to our higher purpose? So I would say that uh, if we put all of humanity, uh, and this is not a marketing gimmick, it's just from a play of words. If I was to put all of humanity into one mixer grinder and uh, what would come out of it if I would say, okay, let's put everyone to understand what is their higher purpose. I think every single person's higher purpose uh, is to return back to source. Everyone's. That's how I see it. The path that one takes is different, is, is different for everybody else. So whilst navigating that path, how can I be authentic to who I am, what I'm here to contribute and use my God-given gifts and talents to express my divinity as I walk that path back to source makes each person's journey unique and different and in reaching that space or that goal of full potential I'm planting those seeds along the way in my own unique way and the seeds that I'm planting is seeds of potential for me as well as for generations to come so um to put it maybe more simply, I would say aligning to who you are meant to be in this lifetime and contribute in this lifetime bases what is your strengths, your innate nature, your unique blueprint supports you to realize your full potential on the path to your true potential. Um, so, as, so when there's that expression of fullness, you've cracked the full potential piece. And then it's like the joy of that journey takes you 
to to that uh, to your true potential which is just to the space or the land of permanency through mm-hmm. the impermanency of life <laughs> right right amrita you have a very good way of articulation <laughs> very well articulated and uh, uh, makes so much of sense so it's like his you... life is actually quite simple uh, it is it's it it is fairly simple uh, and um, i think uh, we complicate it so yes. i think the process of um, decluttering our lives removing the chaos removing the confusion brings the sense of clarity and through that sense of clarity comes simplicity uh, and through the sense of simplicity comes pure masti <laughs> so how do you balance the path of material fulfillment and spiritual enhancement so my focus is on my uh, spiritual goal and whatever i receive through it in the material world i enjoy it right That's no attachments it. just enjoy whatever is coming your way so i won't uh, say that i've reached the space of no attachments uh, but definitely uh, it's work in progress and continuous work in progress and uh, so there are still some things that oh i love this and this is my most favorite and you know i miss my son when he goes away of course all of those things uh, keep keep happening through life but the focus is is in the knowing and in the understanding that um, this is my goal and as a result of that goal they, i meet with different ups and downs in my material life uh, and uh, i enjoy it uh, like like uh, like you know i shared with you uh, as we speak my mother uh, is to her last stage of blood cancer and uh, and we are taking care of her and when i'm with her i'm 100% with her and that's the down of life and i go back to bombay my daughter became her head girl of a school and wow it's an external expression i enjoy that greatly um my husband uh, got me a beautiful ring i enjoy and adorn it beautifully uh, as expression of his love uh but if they're all gone which includes uh, uh my mom the ring my daughter my son in their own way uh it won't stop me from walking the path that i've set myself for Beautiful. Please share your vision with us. Your I'm, vision is uh, which I read. I yeah. Teach as she learns and give as she receives. And serve as I lead. Yes. And that's uh, that's exactly uh, what it is. Um, is um, whatever I learn and I am able to embody as my truth. And whenever it's ready to overflow. that's when i teach it i teach only that which is something that i have learned practiced brought a uh, truth to my life yes. um and whatever i offer uh, is from that space of um, service um and it's a, it's an offering every single day every single thing that i do Uh, is that offering by being just an instrument of divine will uh and uh, the the sense of being that continuous learner being in that space of offering and being mm. completely open to receiving mm. and giving with equal measure knowing that what i receive is not mine in the first place and what i'm giving back is also not mine it's just given through me uh, and not because of me so you said what my vision was far more simply than the way i explained it but that's really my quest every day right what is non violent communication all about 
So non-violent communication and a sweet little interesting story if we have uh, uh, time for it is, um, is I've always heard this term of non-violent communication. I've always heard it, um, uh, the space of ahimsa that uh, came from whatever I had read or learned about Gandhiji. And um, as um, I was as in my family, my husband actually introduced me to non-violent communication. Uh, which I think is a gift to the world from a person called Marshall Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. And what we did was that, um, and it was just a little bit before the lockdown as our children were growing up. And I think the start of the lockdown, I, we started this ritual of, um, he would show us a video every Sunday. And so he took us through a series of eight videos uh, of um, Marshall Rosenberg, which is, uh, on nonviolent communication. And that's really what interested me in it. Uh, to answer that, what is nonviolent communication? I think it's just a language of compassion and it's the language of from the heart. Uh, where, and that also aligns to, the, to everything that we do as coaches uh, and bring as in, in terms of our coaching presence of observing people without judging, going below the surface uh, to understand what their feelings are uh, mm -hmm. and understanding as you un unravel the feelings you come to what is their basic need and then what is the request that they're making of themselves or of others um, and that's really the whole process of non-violent communication and I like I said I, I only like to teach uh, that which I feel comfortable with and I have embodied so there is Marshall Rosenberg introduces the space of what two animals called jackal and giraffe and, and giraffe only because giraffe is the person with the biggest heart and that's why it's giraffe. And so we started this piece at home. So if I tell my son, you have to do this because you love me and if you love me, you will do this for me. Then he'll say, mom, don't use jackal language with me. And so I have to convert myself to a language of compassion and ask the same thing from a space of giraffe and make a request to him rather than try to manipulate his feelings. So we started this practice at home. So I said, let me go out and see how I can bring this to my world um, of uh, coaching, of raising consciousness in people. And so I went and certified and did a course in nonviolent communication and its application to coaching. Uh, and um, that's really, it's, I discovered that it's just another way to hold space and attune to your client's heart and allow your giraffe ears to listen uh, to what they are bringing to the space. So it's just another way uh, to do the same thing is just connection at a heart level and allowing the heart to lead. Sounds very interesting to me and I think I would want to find out more about it. Sounds really good. So last question for this round to you is, uh, I know you believe in the limitlessness of the human potential. So who according to you is limitless? I think... Um... Your source, my source, is uh, limitless. And there's no difference between your source and my source. Um, and so I would say the energy that engulfs you, me, and our entire universe is the limitless energy. And, and attuning uh, to that. Yeah, attuning to that energy um, is really what makes the way for the limitless show that we showcase uh, in this limited time that we have on this planet. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Amrita. So let's move on to our uh, next kind of shorter round. Uh, so this is called the lightning bolt round and I'll just uh, you know ask you some questions to which you can just give me either one word or one liner, two liner answers. So I see that you are very passionate about music. Would you sing a few lines of your favorite song for us? Sure. English or Hindi? Uh, any, any, whatever. It's your choice. Okay. 
So um, I will share uh, the song that I grew up with, which is from my grandfather's movie. And it's the prayer that my mom uh, still sings every night. And uh, it's called Kisi ki muskura hatum pe ho nisar Kisi ka dard le sake to le uthao Kisi ke vaasate ho tere dil me pyaar Jeena isi ka naam hai How beautiful. Actually, that's the truth of life. And beautifully put in a song. Thank you for singing that for us. Do you believe in life after death? 100%. For someone seeking better clarity on their purpose, which is the book you would suggest? I'm not so much of a reader. I've read very few books. But I would say that uh, if, you are, if you can read the Bhagavad Gita or have the Bhagavad Gita taught to you, and I think you, you can read the Bhagavad Gita and the many versions of it. But if you really want to find your true purpose in life, find uh, a teacher who can teach you the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, that's the best book. Yes. For... So what are your top three values based on which you take decisions? Love, trust, and fun. Nice. Who has been that one person who has influenced you the most in your life? My Guruji, undoubtedly. Yes. Please define Amrita in two lines. Two lines. what you see is what you get and uh, my uh, my home uh, is an open invitation if you'd like to walk in you're always welcome so beautiful <laughs> I'm coming over <laughs> always welcome <laughs> Very soon I'm coming. <laughs> okay. So what has been the biggest learning for you this year, Amrita? This year, um, I would say um, the biggest learning has been um, in letting go and letting God shine the light. Letting go, letting God. And that's also a song by Olivia Newton-John. Okay, haven't heard it. I'll find out. <laughs> Do you believe in following daily rituals? 100%. So, 100%. Then, what are they for you? What are your daily rituals? So, there are many that I believe in following, but there are two that uh, I'm committed to follow that I, that I, that is my ritual. Uh, I mean, I wish I could have an exercise ritual and an eating good food ritual and all of those rituals that, I, that I'm continuously working on. But two rituals uh, that are uh, um, sacrosanct, one is prayer and the other is gratitude. Every day, no day passes without them. Without the two of them. Yes. What's the legacy you want to leave behind? The legacy uh, I want to leave behind is that of love and being a loving presence. Uh, and um, yeah, that's it. What does the last one, what does power mean to you? Having enough time and money to be there for people who need me as and when they need me. I love this definition. Because if I, I, I think ask this question to different people, there will be loads of different things which will come out. And I love this definition. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great, Amrita. And any last message you have for the audience before we say goodbye to them? Um, invest uh, in yourself uh, every single day in whichever way that you can. And... Allow yourself 
the gift of personal mastery. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful message. And it was absolute pleasure and an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for having me and from my heart to yours and to everybody else. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> hey, people, I hope you truly, truly enjoyed. And uh, there was at least one thing that you could take with yourself from this whole episode of One Hour. If there is one thing that you would take away, what would be that? Do not forget to put it in the comments. Uh, the recording would be there on YouTube for you to watch. And uh, please do that. And I'll see you next week again with another phenomenal guest. So till then, be limitless. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.